actually saw, I was on the internet, I saw a joke, and um, I forget which company, but somebody uh, put up a graphic that if you just paid the lowest amount of your credit, you know, a thousand years from now, you might be paying like a billion dollars a month or something like that. I mean, that's how it works. I mean, you know, and that's what I talk about, freedom. You know, that's literally, you're in bondage. If somebody, somebody always pays you. It's important. It's really important to think of it that way. The credit will enslave you, it'll drain you, and it'll cut you off when it's done. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the thing about credit is it makes ruining your financial future exceptionally easy because it's just so easy to use. Hey, I just need a car. It doesn't mean anything, right? Um, now, yeah. You said the same thing about student loans? About to talk about this one. Um, now, for example, I have student loans. I have a lot of student loans. I went to law school. But I differentiate between different kinds of loans. Some of your loans will have lower interest rates. For example, I have some federal student loans with interest rates that are actually lower than inflation. Now, those loans, I'm not really going to try to pay off. I'm going to actually pay the lowest amount I can for those because in a sense, I'm actually making money off of those loans. The government is giving me free money to have those loans. So I'm going to pay the lowest amount, I'm going to pay the minimum balance. But for my student loans that are private, those I'm going to put in a little extra each month. Now, I, I have so many student loans, it's not like I'm going to try to pay them all off tomorrow or anything like that. I'm going to put a little extra each month so you can get paid off a little faster. And it's important to think about you know, paying off your debt that way. Is that sort of what you're asking? Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, you. So here, here's an actual. Um, so you, you're probably thinking to yourself, "Hey, it's how are we actually going to pay this stuff down? I have student loans, I have credit cards, I have this, that, and the other thing." Um, a good method um, that I've heard about. Now I'll talk to you about what I used to do. It's funny because uh, I was talking to. Uh, I forgot to go to the house about this or something like that. But what I used to do is I would just look at sort of my bills. Because you know what? I've been through all this stuff. I've had credit debt, I used to get loans. And, you know, when I got out of college, I did not profit work for a bunch of years. So I've literally had times where, you know, I, I once went on a date, let me put it this way. I went on a date, I'm out with this girl. Um, we get to the place where we're supposed to go. Um, we were going to go rock climbing. It cost like five dollars. <laughs> I think I had six dollars. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm like, all right, so you just get yours and I'll be over there. It's not fun. It wasn't fun. But you know, I've also had a job that pays me really well, and I've also been able to invest. I've also met a lot of people who've been in different positions. So what I used to do, the way I would think about debt, is this is the smart way to think about it, is you have your debt and you look for as high as it can to have. So let's say you have a credit card that has I would go and target the highest interest payment first and pay that one down and then go to the next one. So that's one way to do it. That's the like smart way to do it. But what I found actually is sort of a human psychology way to do it. Um, I found there's this guy called the Dead Snowball. I forgot there's a guy, there's a guy from the South, Dave Ramsey, who came up with this. Um, so the idea of the Dead Snowball is that what you do is you line up all your debts and you take them sort of largest to small, let's say you have a thousand dollar one, five thousand dollar one, that's the interest rate. Yeah. Uh, no, no, so it's for like the lower interest rate, so if they, they, they want to get, you know, you pay out, you know, the minimum amount each month, so they don't know that you have a 30% outstanding difference with that balance to the lower interest rate. So I'll say for this, one of the things I forgot to say is I'm going to list 11 things, 11 different steps to this. You all should be thinking about at least one of those things that's uh, happening in your life that you would like to work on. Because really what this group is about is about mastermind minds. It's not about me up here speaking. It's not about me, you know, being used to kind of talking about all the stuff I know. It's about me giving you guys some ideas so that you can get into groups and you can actually work this stuff out. Like Dan said, lots of people read these books or watch these TV shows. Buy some video, you get all pumped up, and you're like, I'm going to 
change and do this and that. Maybe you do for a couple of weeks and nothing happens. But life is about action, you know. And action is really, really, if you want to have power in your life, it's about taking, organizing that effort and using a group that can inspire you. So it's cool that you're really thinking about these things because later when you guys are in a group, it'll be really good for you to contribute. And we actually do hope um, that you guys will continue to keep in touch with the next six weeks until the next group to really make progress over that time. Okay. So we reached the end of stand. So I'm going to repeat the different, the four different parts of stand. The first one: spend less than your income. The second one: don't buy more house, car, etc. than you can comfortably afford long term. Okay. The third one: max out your 401k. And if you once you can do that, invest in an IRA. Just remember, bust a cat. Um, the fourth one is pay down your credit and other high interest debt, and then use it sparingly, if at all. Okay. So walk. Um, so as I said, walk is what will really allow you to make your money work for you and to create a comfortable life. Walk isn't about you being Bill Gates or something, but walk will allow you to be very comfortable. Um, combined with Stan, you're doing them together. So I guess I should point out that it, it's not like you necessarily have to do all this in order or until you're, um, you know, you have your 401k going and you can't do anything else. You should do what works in this system, but the more of it you can get going in your life, the more powerful it will be. Okay. So combined with Stan, walk sort of has a synergistic um, it'll allow you to take very large strides in case instead of occasional and halting steps. Um, without stand, without having the four elements of stand handled, walk will look very impressive from the outside, but you'll be one disaster away from serious financial trouble. Okay. So, step one in walk, you want to have three to six months of your expenses saved up in an emergency fund. Um, this is what Sandra calls your nephew to your boss money. So, and that's the point. When you have that much money saved up, if something happens with your job, I mean, your life is in ruin. But right now, if you have nothing saved up, you think that you're basically two or three paychecks from asking people to help you out. That's no good. Um, but having this money saved up is that it means that if you lose your job, if you need to leave your job, if you get sick, um, if you don't know if you're going to have regular pay for a little while, if you have any other financial disaster, you'll be okay for these three to six months. Actually, probably longer, because once you're in that position, you'll probably actually start spending a lot less. So, um, not going into debt and not potentially losing your hard money. You won't, you won't go into debt, and you won't have the potential of losing your hard-earned house or car. You won't have trouble paying your kids' tuition. Um, you won't have trouble affording, say, gas or a cab or a metro card so you can get to another job. But all these things are possible if you don't have an emergency fund. Okay. So, again, how to do this. We talked a little bit about auto deductions. That's the way I would do it. I would just, say, look for a certain percentage or maybe a dollar amount. Maybe you can just put aside $50 a month. Now, one of the first important things that you need to do to have this work is you actually need to figure out how much you need to spend every month. And I mean, like, your real necessities. Like, you know, I need uh, to pay rent. And I need a certain amount of food. Not like, you know, I need to go to movies, to the movies or something like that. You really need to know what your necessities are in order to make this work. If you don't know that, then you might budget less money if you're running on two months instead of four. Um, another really great method for saving money, and this one will be a little more controversial because none of us like paying more taxes, um, but this was actually something I was talking to Allison about lately, is that um, what I would do is I would uh, always take as many um, deductions on my tax form as possible, or as many uh, withholdings as possible. Um, but a great way to save money, and this is up to you if you want to do this, is that you can take no withholdings. 
And so what that means is that at the end of that year, you're going to get a huge tax return. And that's a way that you are actually using the government to auto deduct from your paycheck every month. The thing is, is that of course the government is making money, interest off that money they're holding from you all year. But if the alternative is that you would have spent that five, six, ten, twenty dollars or whatever extra on uh, lunch one day, you know, a drink this or that time, as opposed to getting back a huge amount of money at the end of the year, that's going to put you way ahead for your savings and emergency funds. It's up to you. So I actually um, take no withholdings. So I can look forward to next year a huge um, return. And it'll make it makes it much easier for me to save. And I don't notice it. Okay. So the next one. Um, you want to have one to five thousand dollars saved up in what I would call a sub-emergency cash flow. Um, so what this means, and again, this amount, I give it a range, depends on how much your income is um, and what your spending habits are. So I give it a range. Um, what a sub-emergency cash fund means is that sometimes it's not always a huge crisis. Sometimes you don't lose your job, but you do want to have a separate savings fund and you do want to have your emergency fund. But sometimes, uh, you know, maybe you do want to go on that trip or, you know, maybe your kids maybe need braces or something like that. And you do need a little bit of extra money put aside, and you don't want to blow your budget. So it's good that if you are making a budget, you just start putting a little bit aside in this fund. You know, once you get it sort of funded, you're fine. Let's say for you it's $1,000. You get $1,000 saved up. If your friend comes to you and says, hey, let's go on a trip, it's totally OK. So here's the thing. You want to create a financial plan that's not horrible, that's not like beating you down all the time. It's not like, um, you know, I hate all this saving. You want to build into it that you actually can do fun stuff that because humans aren't meant to just be stressed out and you know um, not have any not not ever be able to do anything fun your whole life that's not going to work you're going to quit the plan if you do that so you need to build in an outlet for yourself that when you do need some extra money or want some extra money when you do want to go on that trip uh, when you do want to spend a little extra money on hanging out with your friends whatever you can so I would call it the sub-emergency cash fund. I'm going to put away one to five thousand dollars in that. <coughs> okay, so number seven, and this is the one I probably would expect a grumble or two out of this one. Um, is that just for your regular general savings? I would say you want to put away about twenty percent of your income. So where did I get that number from? I made it up. It's a good number, 20%. It's a place to, I would say for you, it depends on where you are, but start somewhere. Make, if 20% is a lot to you, then make that your goal. I know people who do 40% of their income, they put it away. It's ridiculous how much money they save up, but they can use for whatever they want later. Um, but start with 1%, if that's what you have to start with, and maybe add an extra percentage point every two or three, because you can use auto deductions again, you just have your boss in business, you can uh, do it straight from your bank account, you know. Um, so 20% for some of you will be a goal. Uh, for others of you, it might be kind of small. But it's just, it's a number because you really want to start saving up this money so that you can use it for the kind of investments that you're going to need to make if you actually want to, you know, have power in your financial life. So for that 20% of your income, would you include the amount that you're putting away into your 401k or something? But you know what? Here's the thing. I mean, if you see, I see you're uh, <laughs> You know what? Don't, don't, I mean, 20%, I'm giving you something to aspire to. That's the point. So start at 1%. Or start at, start at 5%. And then what you do is you just add one extra percent every three months. Maybe you'll get to 10% and you say, that's okay for me right now, for where I am. But it's up to you. It's, just, it's an aspiration. Fine. Just going with the market. So that's why it's really important for you to do your own work. You want to sit up? Yeah. You come up front. <coughs> uh, so you said that over time people don't really beat the market? Over time, uh, most investors over the long term don't generally beat the market. 
So this applied for hedge fund managers? What's that? This applied for hedge fund managers? And um, I mean, well, right now we're not really talking about hedge funds, but um, and I, I'm not invested in any hedge funds. Um, but the, the returns that hedge fund, hedge fund managers make is actually in dispute that, you know, some of these people may not actually make the kind of returns that they say they can. But the other thing is that uh, maybe they don't need to make returns long term with those types of clients because the idea is that you put something in for a couple of years, you know, you make a bunch of money on these companies and then you invest in these other things. So, you know, it, it's, you know what, that's for a whole different sort of uh, class of investor hedge funds. Uh, Specialized in you know, high risk. Exactly. It's not yeah, for the know. average investor at all. So, so <laughs> if most of the managers <laughs> never really turn a profit, then. Well, I didn't say they didn't turn a profit. I what said most say? don't they, beat the market. They don't beat the market. So let's say that the stock market between now and you know 1934 has made maybe not the number, but let's say it's made eight percent. You know, um, so let's pretend it just did like this. It's really like that. Uh, but let's say you decide you're going to get uh, invest with investor X, who's been around for five years or ten years, and. You know, for many of those years, he's been getting 13%. But if you sort of line him up for 20 years, he would probably, many of them, end up underneath where the index is. So I'm not saying it's, that's for everybody. I'm not saying that applies to everybody. But it's up to you to do your homework to figure out if that's true or not. Because it's true for a lot of people. Yeah. So then how, because a lot of, when you try to invest in a mutual fund, and I remember just going back a few years back, we would say, well, you want to invest with these guys because over the past five to ten years, he's been successful. So that's the guy you want to invest with. But if you're saying that that's not a good idea because over time... Well, I didn't say it's not always a good idea, but I said that you have to do your homework. And so what should you be... Because one of, you know, one of the sort of maxims of investing is that past returns are not an indicator of future right. returns. You know, sure. Just because somebody made a bunch of money. Think about it this way. I'm an investor. Hey, you guys all, everybody give me your $5. I'm going to invest your $5 in, two, in the year 2000 in the real estate market. We're going to make a ton of money, right? We're going to make a lot of money. It's 2006 now. Come on, guys. Look how much money I've made on all this. So now all the suckers are coming in, right? Every, and I, you know what? I'm not, I'm not a scammer or anything. I'm actually a really good investor. I'm making tons of money. Why shouldn't you invest with me? And what happened in 2007? So that's what, I mean, that's, that's just it. I'm just saying is that you you really need to think, you know, how you want to invest your money, whether you want to invest in, um, whether there are some people with proven track records, whether it's better to go with uh, just investing in an index, um, or whether you want to invest with somebody who's maybe, who's maybe a little more short-term and who you have faith in, you know. But the point isn't to say don't invest in these particular types of instruments. The point is to say don't just believe what somebody's telling you. That you have to go out there and investigate and learn. But there's lots of, I mean, you know what? Here, give me $6. I'll take it. <laughs> you know what? People will take your money. So it's up to you to decide if you want to give it to them. Now, what I, what I was getting at is when you said do your homework, what other aspects would you look at? Well, you know what? Start with that book. Okay. Yeah. What book did you write on that? It's called Unconventional Success by David Swenson. Yeah. But also, like, your horizon should be on a 10 year spectrum. That's yeah. what they tell you is the safe estimate so okay. that you can account for the bumps and the, you know, the highs and lows that are going to occur over time. So, you want to, it's called like the whole practice is like asset allocation. So, you want to make it so that you're taking some risk based on your position, but you don't want to be completely and totally conservative or completely risk. Risky in, in the investment, so it's just a balance based on what your circumstances are at a given time. And that, that goes to where I, you know, the, what is it? When I said, you know, figure out how to balance your portfolio. Like, you really need to figure out how that works. Like I said, if you're just taking somebody's. Now, I'm not, a lot of these people are experts, you know. Uh, for example, I'm a lawyer. I wouldn't say that if you're in real trouble, don't just run up into the court and not get somebody to help you. But maybe you should understand what's going on too. You know, for somebody, before you end up with an outcome that you really don't like and you don't understand what happened. You know, because 
that happens all the time, whether financially, legally, whether you know, they're plumbing, your plumber shows up, your house is flooding, and hey, I'm gonna need an extra thousand dollars. You know what? Figure it out a little bit. Especially this is your money. <coughs> just, just a comment. Mm -hmm. So we do some financial business. So in 2008, the market was down.
it's really about you putting yourself in a position where you can even see those things. I'm sure if you think about times in your life, you've, you've been able to see something like, wow, that's amazing. You've had a friend who's like, oh, you can't do that. Oh, that's not possible. It's like they almost can't even see it. You need to expand sort of who you are so you can see these things. Because they're, they're literally always coming into your life. <coughs> um, so talking about myself, some things that I've done uh, to sort of you know, work on myself. Uh, you know, I've been to lectures all the time. Uh, I got my law degree and went back to school, education. Uh, constantly reading uh, to learn more. Constantly, anybody who knows me knows that I'm discussing all of these things and many different things constantly. Um, I joined discussion groups a couple of years ago. I was um, went to work on my public speaking, so I actually started doing improv. I did a couple of shows. Uh, do you think that probably helps me be able to do this up here right now? Yep. It opened up an opportunity I wouldn't have had otherwise, right? Um, I meditate. Constantly trying to learn new talents and skills. The thing about this is that <clears throat> when you're really talking about getting to that next level, a lot of it is going to come down to your creativity. You know, it's not necessarily like, oh, here, you know, I invest in these classified ads, fine, for whatever. It's going to be, how are you creative that you can actually create something or go in a direction that somebody else maybe is unwilling to, or somebody else doesn't have the vision to go in. Maybe somebody else just can't even see it because they don't see it as they're in reality. But you can because you've actually been working on who you are for the past <coughs> the next number of months or years or whatever. Um, the other thing is that once you do start, you know, if you get to the point where you have all these, these different kind of savings, these different, even before you do this, you can have a lot of different savings, a lot of different investments. You need to have a mindset where you can actually take advantage of all heard the stories about lottery players who lose all their money because they have a certain kind of mindset. They are not ready to handle all that stuff. You know, if you're not sort of growing along, becoming, thinking about the kind of person that you want to be, you're not really growing with it. Well, you're gonna get all that money together, and maybe you might end up blowing it. So you really need to sort of grow and expand um, in this process. <coughs> so. You you got to think of yourself as an asset. There's many different assets that you know, but sure the most important one, you know. And you have to constantly be investing in and improving that asset to make it as powerful and profitable as you can. Um, a couple of uh, sort of uh, suggestions, side suggestions. Something I would recommend. Um, is that you need to sit down and really identify your strengths. And this is actually really, really important. This is really important. Um, I would recommend that you sit down and you start to think about what your strengths are on all of them. Maybe you just sit down for 20 minutes and you just write these things down. What are your strengths? Um, what are areas that you lack, maybe that you don't understand, or that you just have just an example? Why do just I take all those things and write them? It's a good way to sort of start to start thinking about it. Uh, <coughs>
might, it's, it's interesting, this is sort of a side thing, but a lot of people don't think about this sitting in. You might find yourself in a situation where you're actually starting to create intellectual property, um, things that you've actually created that you own, or you're actually getting you know, <coughs> income from something. So that's just something that I recommend that you start to think about earlier, because it does happen. Okay. So number 10. Um, <coughs> You want to invest in securities, businesses, or real estate that you own, and businesses or real estate that others own. Now, the goal of this is, while you're going through this process of these investments, you've saved all this money, what was the point? This is the point. The goal is that your after-tax income from these investments be at least equal to your total expenses. So, some of you guys may have heard this before. It's very okay, so for example, let's say that my total expenses, and you've identified this early on when you made your three to six months of emergency savings, let's say my total expenses are $1,000. Let's say my income is, well, $1,500. Now, as I'm beginning to make these investments in securities and businesses and real estate that I actually own, multiple investments in securities and businesses and real estate that other people own, and these investments, my first goal is to get to my income from these multiple investments, not from my job, equaling $1,000, $1,001. What's the point of that? The point is that once you can do that, you're free in a certain way. Now, all that money from your primary job can go to your investments. You know, now you can actually start to make huge leaps. I would say for your self-employed, then if you want to make, make these investments, I would count your primary, you know, your, your, your business as sort of your job. You know? But you want to have things coming from multiple places of income. Um, you want to get to that point where if something happened, it's no longer, now I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to get for my savings, or I'm stressed out about um, what I'm going to do about a job, where you're actually fine. But beyond that is that now all that money from your job is just pure money you're investing. You can put all that back. And so then your next goal is to get all that money from your investments to 2000 4000 and 8000 and build it up from there. It's much easier once you're not just relying on a paycheck and literally all that money that you are getting from a paycheck can be reinvested. And when you are reinvested, then you can reinvest the money from your investments and you can make even more. Questions? So the, the three to six month bond, mm -hmm. uh, should that be invested? Um, you should have that in a very safe investment. Yeah. <coughs> which as you learn about sort of portfolio balancing and stuff, you understand which ones are safer than others. But yeah, like oh, everything you have should be invested in something. But some investments are very, very, very safe, but not going to make you very much. And other investments are less safe, but you'll make higher rates of return. Um, <coughs> so let's see. So yeah, I actually would consider this, once you get to this point, I would consider it sort of a huge milestone. You, you've really taken a huge step. You're, you're sort of, you're in a different class than other people at this point. Um, so how do you find these opportunities that you're going to invest in? Well, you invest in yourself, and you actually go out there and you invest in yourself, you get involved in things, you learn things, and that's how you get opportunities, you meet people. You start connecting with people, and you do number 11, which I'm about to talk about. So, number 11, invest in other people. I would say 9, 10, 11 are all equally important. Um, everything I said about investing in yourself applies here. Um, you want to nurture the people around you. Now, it's interesting, at least for me, because this was something really finally got this. It was, it was sort of a big deal because uh, I feel like um, 
Well, I'll talk about me, I don't know about most people, but you know, it's easy to sort of live in a small kind of way. It's easy to live and then you're just an individual. You just handle it yourself, you take care of it, it's not a problem. But you gotta realize, if you're living, if you're living like that, you have the lid on. You know, and you have to take the lid off. You have to realize if you affect other people constantly, and other people are having an effect on you. You know, people can bring opportunities into your life if you let them. But if you think, hey, I'm just over here and that's the rest of the world, well, that's not really gonna happen. So investing in other people, you want to nurture the people around you so that um, they can find improvements in their life. Um, what happens is their lives are improving, they're going to bring opportunities in your life too. <coughs> you want to encourage them. 